Well, and thank you so much for um, taking the time to, to sit down and um, talk to us about your campaign um, and your vision for the Fifth Ward. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with you, um, could you just tell us a little about yourself, your name, um, Chicago, you know, how do you be Chicago and, and, and what you kind of are doing currently? Okay, so my name is William Calloway. I am a community, community organizer. I am the founder and executive director of a nonprofit entitled Christian Air. Um, we focus and specialize in violence prevention, civic and uh, social education. Um, and social and fighting social injustice. Uh, how do I view Chicago? Um, that's interesting. Uh, Chicago is a city of many neighborhoods. Uh, I think it's one of the most segregated cities in the city. Of, I mean, in the nation. Um, and I think it's the best city, regardless of all the things and that we have been faced with, the controversies and the obstacles that we had to hurdle over these past several years, even decades even. Mm -hmm. I think it's the best best country in the world. I mean, the best city in the world, excuse me. Um, and, you know, you have to be from here or have to have visit or live here to truly understand um, how unique this city really is, how tough this city really is. And I'm just grateful to be here. I'm grateful to have a lot of my roots here and family and loved ones and, and neighbors and such and such. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, in moving to Chicago, I've been here a little over six years now. Um, and I know one of the things I, I really love is, like you said, you have to be in Chicago to truly understand the beauty of it, right? When people come to visit Chicago, they're like, wow, like, this is an amazing city. But unfortunately, it's totally opposite of what the media portrays. Like, you know, throughout um, the country. But what are your favorite parts of the city? South Shore. South Shore, okay, okay. <laughs> South Shore, South Shore, without a doubt. That's my, that's my neighborhood. Okay. Um, it's the east side of the yeah. city, lakefront. It's the only African-American uh, neighborhood that sits on the lakefront. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from, uh, from Rogers Park all the way down, down south. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's beautiful. It's the home of uh, Kanye West, Michelle Obama, uh, Jesse Jackson, um, so many prominent f uh, figures yeah. and, and, and people from the city of Chicago have uh, resided in South Shore, yeah. and it's, that's my favorite place. That's what's up, cool. Um, so in growing up um, and, and now kind of having a voice in um, social justice reform and kind of being a community organizer and activist where did you first learn the power of your voice church okay church my mother's a minister okay yeah so um there's a black woman and a black woman in ministry and just a single mother yeah, i think she always taught me the power of my voice mm -hmm. the power of really speaking up speaking truth to power and i think that of course um that 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 resonates with my faith um, speaking against and uh, speaking up against corruption mm -hmm. and things that you see wrong and just always knowing as a leader sometimes you have to use your voice when it's not popular mm -hmm. and sometimes when you have to do it alone and and I think as it is is uh, coming from a household of faith um, that's why I really learned to use my use my voice since I was a child. What's up? Um, it's interesting. Uh, we spoke with um, another oh, individual. Go ahead. A, 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 and Tupac Shakur. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. Pac taught me to. I listened to a lot of Shakur uh, growing up. So okay. it, him and my household. That's, gotcha. That's gotcha. What I'm yeah. It's interesting. Like I think um, when you talk with individuals, um, specifically uh, black people, the church plays a very huge role in how we show up in the world, right? Whether it's um, our first introduction to um, social justice, our first introduction to utilizing our boys, first introduction to leadership. Um, I think in, in many of the conversations I've had with people, it's that interesting thread of the church, and specifically the black church. I think it's just a powerful force um, within our community. Um, so how did that kind of catapult you into being the activist that you are? And what was that turning point that you said, you know, like, I'm out in the street, um, 
leading these movements, but I think politics is 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 where I need to go. What what was that like? Yeah, that was yeah, that was an interesting, <laughs> that was an interesting shift. Yeah, uh, when when it happened, well, I got into activism because of the untimely death of a young woman named Rakia Boyd. Mm. Uh, she was shot and killed by an off-duty Chicago police officer in 2012. That's what uh, activated me, if you will. She was. She was my Michael Brown, my Tamir Rice, my uh, my Laquan McDonald. Okay. Yeah, so that's what Rakia meant to me. She okay. activated me. Um, years down the line, I just seen how much of this, no matter how many people you put in the streets, when it boils down to change, it, it boils down to policy makers and the people that these figureheads and decision makers that was in these policy uh, making roles um, that oversaw a lot of the things that we wanted to see change. Yeah. And I was like, you know, well, we have to get in those positions of power. I've been always civically engaged. I think that's something that I've always been involved with is mm-hmm. being civically engaged. But in Chicago, just watching the, the plight of so many uh, people, of black people, and watching the fact that we didn't have any people um, in bureaucracy rooting for us or speaking up for us, that's what really engaged me to to get into policy. Yeah, I think um, I was having a conversation with, um, I forgot where I was, some event, and and we were just talking about oftentimes um, this, demonizing is a strong word, but like individuals activists and politicians right like when you're an activist oftentimes when you want to get into politics it's like oh man like you're going into politics like that's where the corruption is but i think you hit it right on the head like everyone has a role to play like you need agitators activists in the street you need those same people that are going to be making those policies and then you also need those orchestrators right those people who are funding and they can't necessarily be involved but they got your back from the inside so i think that's really interesting um that you brought that up um but how has that transition been for you um kind of like starting your campaign running the campaign and now actually in the runoff yeah so it's uh it's a it's an interesting space it's it's kind of a uh, sometimes I think it's a difficult space to navigate because, you know, as an activist and just even as a m- millennial black man, um, you unapologetic with the things that you say, yeah. right? So now, and it's not necessarily that you filter what you say, but since you have a, a, such a large, broader a constituency, <clears throat> you want them to understand what you're saying. Yeah. So now you might have to sort of uh, tailor your message in a point like, okay, you're taking what I'm saying out of context. Mm-hmm. Let me let mm-hmm. me explain it to you like this. Mm-hmm. Instead of before, it's just like this is what I said, this is how I'm saying it, and if you get it, get it. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But now um, it's it's just it's, it teaches you patience. Mm-hmm. It teaches you uh, to uh, to enlarge your communication skills um, with people and. Uh, and just something I always believed in is just listening more. Yeah. It helps you listen more to yeah. people. Definitely. Because you are, I mean, you're, you're trying to bring in this huge net. I mean, Fifth Ward is a very diverse <laughs> place, right? You have your South Shore, but you also have your High Park, right. which is one of the more diverse places in the city. Right. Um, and... Um, it is interesting um, to be able to do that. So no, that that's awesome. Um, and, and kind of going off of that, we I since being here, I've lived in the Fifth Ward. Um, often people explain this as like the tale of two cities, right? Yeah. Um, you have your highly invested in areas, and then you have those areas that kind of go underdeveloped. What's your plan to like spread that development throughout the ward? Yeah. So. That's interesting that you say that because while I've been on the campaign trail, I've been pushing and promoting this message of the tale of two wards. Mm-hmm. You have this one part of the war which is very thriving and robust, um, economically sound, relatively safe, and which is high part. Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, on the other side of the spectrum for the war, you have another war, another side of the war which is relatively unsafe. Mm-hmm. Six consecutive years in a food desert, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the the neighborhood that I come from and just pretty much I want us as the fifth ward neighbors to know that if we're going to fix this we have to fix this as a family 
and one community or one neighborhood shouldn't get more attention than another. That's not fair, that's not equality, that's not equity. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that the finances that the Fifth Ward receives, um, the menu money is allocated uh, equally all around the Fifth Ward. That's why I believe in participatory budgeting, where mm -hmm. we could bring community members in from everywhere to say, hey, hey, listen, this is how the money should be allocated. Yeah. This is where it should be spent. And um, this is the process we should go about to spend it. And that's what I plan on doing once I'm elected on April 2nd, is to make sure we bring um, an all-inclusive group together to make sure that the money, the resources, the investment is fair and is proper. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the things that I'm most excited about since living in the fifth ward uh, and attending ward meetings and, and talking um, with uh, our current alderman, the incumbent who's running. Um, one specific thing that it seems that there was never action on, all of a sudden there's action, right? Like this grocery store is coming, this new like entertainment area is coming, which is great, right? Um, but it just seems like, why now? Like, you know, this is six years, right? Like, um, and of course, in Chicago, we know why. Um, but in, in talking kind of about the, the, the current um, alderman, um, oftentimes I think a lot of people are confused or, or not aware of what it means for an alderman to vote 100% of the time with a mayor in whatever, right? What, what does that mean and how has that impacted um, our ward specifically? Yeah, well, it's not just, uh, it's just not a mayor, it's Rahm Emanuel. Yeah, and I yeah, think yeah, that's because yeah. if she voted maybe 100% with a mayor like here in Washington, maybe it would, it would be completely different. But but since it's Rahm Emanuel, it shows that where her, her political allegiance lies. Mm -hmm. And it's not to the people of the Fifth Ward. It's not, to, as an alderman, it's not the people to the Fifth Ward and to, and to the city of Chicago. Um, as a councilman, it's not to the people, to, to the Chicagoans at large, it's to him and to his, uh, his politics, right? And it, he's one of the most digressive uh, mayors that we've seen, or uh, regressive mayors that we have seen in quite some time. Um, he covered up the murder of Laquan McDonald. He closed, uh, he managed to close 50 uh, schools, uh, mostly in the African American community, mental health closings. Um, no investments in the south and west sides. Our bond junk status is, is almost to F. We've seen uh, the pension status is horrible. He has no remedy for that. It's just voting 100% of the time just lets you know and, and not that where she stands, but not only that, she was awarded with a $20,000 campaign donation from Rahm Emanuel after the fact. So it just lets you know these pay to play politic games that people are playing. And far as you were just speaking on the political ploys, with her announcing all of a sudden, conveniently, that a grocery store is coming two weeks before the, the February election, it's, a, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. I think it's disrespectful to the intelligence of the voters. Also, this this entertainment center has been um, promoted to come, be incoming for the past several years. This is not something that she just announced. Mm -hmm. In 2015 and 2016, she also announced this as well. So all of this is, is really is just something to try to garner her support to try to re-energize uh, her failing base in the fifth war and to really trick a lot of voters to believe that she's some type of a community developer um, in a failing community, um, which is not the case. She is the reason why the fifth war, particularly on the 71st Street Corridor, yeah. is, 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 is in the shape that it's in. And it's in 20 years in office, um, she has nothing to show for it. And it's time for the fifth war to go into a new direction. Um, three more things uh, and we, before we close out. I um, uh, want to talk about um, the Cop Academy. Um, and um, so, and because we're in the Fifth Ward, of course, that's just where my, my, my knowledge lies, right? So, you know, she voted with it and then changed recently. Um, but help people understand what is this? What is this cop academy, and how is this detrimental um, to our community, uh, communities of color um, specifically? Uh, for, well, for one, uh, well, it depends how we look at it. If we're talking strictly on training for Chicago police officers, I think you know a lot of us already feel that. Um, more police officers in the city of Chicago would not help us reduce violence. There's, there's no scientific 
um, research uh, data that conclude adding more law enforcement to the streets of Chicago uh, helps with violence reduction. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is training, period. Under the current status quo of the Chicago Police Department, even though they have made some reforms, Chicago Police Department is still broken. And until the consent decree is fully enforced, and we've seen some changes dramatically, there shouldn't be any more, it should be a hiring freeze, to, in my opinion, um, on the Chicago Police Department. Uh, the third thing is the financial mismanagement of, of the uh, Cop Academy. Um, it took, a lot of people don't understand it's a $95 million, but the thing that a lot of people don't understand is they're, they're borrowing, the city of Chicago is borrowing off a bond. And once the interest is paid back off of that bond, ultimately it would be $275 million mm -hmm. for this COP Academy. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of information that's not being put out to the public that a lot of people um, need to know about. And she only voted against it this time is because she knew her opponent was an activist, comes from the activist community, and would have slammed or hammered her, uh, her on it. I think if she would have ran on the polls, or even if she would have ran against somebody else that didn't come from the activist community, um, she would have voted for it. Um, so I think that's where, uh, just uh, just brief views on, on my perspective on the COP Academy. I don't think that we need one. I think when you look at the police misconduct settlement suits that she has and so many in city council have voted for throughout the years, in the past 10 years, close to a billion dollars in police misconduct settlement suits, right? Um, on top of that, um, she voted for the $5.5 .5 million settlement of Laquan McDonald. This is too much money going to mismanagement and to waste mm -hmm. and things that we could use to invest into communities. We yeah. don't need an additional $95 million to go to a uh, to fund a department mm -hmm. that always already has cost us a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mismanagement of money and we need to talk about, um, we really need to talk about more about reform mm -hmm. and um, other training practices before we talk about building a cop academy. Cool. So you get elected. What are your top three priorities? Oh, man. I want to, the, the shop and save is a no go. I think that's a. I think that we need the whole construction on that. I think mm -hmm. that we need to bring other uh, full service grocery stores to the table and see if we can reverse this thing. A lot of people in the community is upset that it is a shopping save. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, a, a Mariano's or something. Mm -hmm. Why we can create a, a community co-op, right, mm -hmm. where community stakeholders can come together. We have a lot of skill set and talent enough in our community and our ward um, to bring people together to create a co-op to create Black empowerment. Um, I want to hire an uh, efficient ward superintendent that can listen to the constituency concerns and add the responsiveness that they deserve. Um, man, it's, it's a lot. I just want to hit the ground running on a lot of things. It's a lot of issues that we're facing, like, for real. So, the runoff is in a couple weeks. Um, really excited uh, about it and to be able to, um, to vote for you. But how can people support you in these last few weeks and, and help you out? Oh, no doubt. If you would like to be involved with our campaign any type of way, they can log on to www.callawayfor5.com, callawayfor5.com. Mm -hmm. They find a way they can donate, sign up to volunteer, follow us on social media, also at Callaway for 5 Visit us at, at our campaign headquarters at 2030 East 71st Street. We'd love to have you. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, William, and good luck to you. I appreciate it.